I am Alan Schechter, and as an advisor to the Office of NIH History and the Step Museum at the National Institute of Health, I welcome you all to this first lecture in a planned monthly series of talks on biomedical history. This one via teleconferencing, but hopefully soon in person at the NIH where we can return to in-person work uniformly again. The Office of NIH History has existed at NIH for about 35 years and has had many functions, ranging from the archiving of NIH documents and instruments to the training of several dozen fellows in historical research and publications. A full description of the office and its associated step museum can be found at its website, history.nih.gov. In recent months, Chris Wanjack, the acting NIH historian, I and several of our colleagues felt that we could now best serve the NIH community by initiating a series of talks related to the history of NIH research, covering personal and ethical perspectives, as well as more technical aspects of biomedical research. We are particularly pleased that former NIDDK director, Alan Spiegel, starts this series with today's talk entitled, A Brief History of Eugenics in America, Implications for 21st Century Medicine. <clears throat> Dr. Spiegel had a distinguished 33-year career in basic and clinical endocrine research at the Bethesda campus, including serving as intramural scientific director and then as institute director. From 2006 to 2018, he was Dean of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City, where he remains on, the, on their faculty. Dr. Spiegel's talk today will review the eugenics movement in early 20th century America, and then he will discuss the thorny questions raising by, raised by striking advances in biomedicine in the 21st century, such as in vitro fertilization, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, genome editing and reproductive cloning. <clears throat> By the way, these are basically subjects of the current number one bestseller of all nonfiction books in the United States by Walter Isaacson, which many of you may have heard about. I now happily turn the screen and microphone over to our distinguished colleague for this important lecture, Alan. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, having uh, left Bethesda for the beautiful Bronx in March of 2006. Uh, I've really actually uh, never uh, left Bethesda or the NIH, uh, where, as you said, I spent 33 very rewarding years. And so it was uh, a pleasure to accept your invitation and that of the Office of History at NIH uh, to give uh, this lecture. Uh, the talk will begin with a review necessarily uh, brief of the history of the 20th century American eugenics movement. And then uh, I'll provide some selected examples illustrating how technology, technological advances in science have really ushered in what I will call a new eugenics era. And finally, I will describe, but certainly not be able to answer or resolve the, the really profound bioethical issues raised by these powerful new techniques, including, for example, human genome editing. So uh, I, as Alan knows, uh, once gave a medical grand rounds on this subject, and it's traditional to begin a grand rounds with a case report. And this was the case report I began that grand rounds with, but it is a Supreme Court case report, Buck versus Bell, uh, Carrie Buck, who is pictured on the left with her mother, Emma, in Virginia, facing involuntary sterilization, uh, where the state of Virginia brought this case to the Supreme Court, in essence, in an effort to get a national mandate for involuntary sterilization of perceived inadequate genetically individuals. And this is in 1927, an eight to one decision of the Supreme Court to endorse this forced sterilization, 
with the Supreme Court Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes rendering the decision seen here on the left. And the end of the paragraph has the, the infamous words that signify this decision, three generations of imbeciles are enough. But let's look at the further text. Oliver Wendell Holmes writes, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. And he's speaking from personal experience. In fact, Holmes Jr. was nearly fatally wounded at the Battle of Antietam in the Civil War in 1862. And the notion that eugenically fit individuals would lose their lives, thus harming the gene pool as it were, is really part of the background of this eugenics movement. He goes on to say, it would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination, a topic of great interest now, and he reasons from that principle it's broad enough to cover cutting of the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And when he uses the word imbecile, this is a term with a technical meaning at that time. The Stanford Binet IQ test categorizes cognitive insufficiency with idiots, imbeciles, and morons in a order of decreasing cognitive ability. Emma, and her illegitimate daughter, Carrie, were purportedly imbeciles. Carrie was raped in the home of foster parents and institutionalized to hide the pregnancy, and the daughter born, Vivian, and that then precipitated the decision to sterilize her. Harry Laughlin, head of something called the Eugenics Record Office, and this same Laughlin, by the way, in a theme I'll develop shortly, was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Heidelberg University in Germany in 1936. And he actually picked up the doctorate since he wasn't able to attend the ceremony at Rockefeller Institute. Again, an association between Rockefeller, as we'll see, and this eugenics movement. He says, these people belong to the shiftless, ignorant and worthless class of antisocial whites of the South, as if that were a justification for her forced sterilization. A professor at UVA Law School, Paul Lombardo, many years later, actually located Carrie and her daughter Vivian in rural Virginia, found Carrie to be reading a newspaper, doing a crossword puzzle, and documented Vivian had average grades in elementary school. So even the pretext for the forced sterilization was incorrect. Now, this lengthy text is really the birth of the term eugenics. As in most other cases of novel views, the wrongheadedness of objectors to eugenics has been curious. The most common misrepresentations now are that its methods must be altogether those of compulsory unions, as in breeding animals. It is not so. And the writer goes on to talk about preventing the free propagation of the stock of those seriously affected by lunacy, feeble-mindedness, habitual criminality, and pauperism. But that is quite different from compulsory marriage. So the argument is restraining ill-omened marriages is a question by itself, by seclusion, or in other ways yet to be divined. I cannot doubt that our democracy will ultimately refuse consent to that liberty of propagating children, which is now allowed to the undesirable classes. But the populace has yet to be taught the true state of these things. A democracy cannot endure unless it be composed of able citizens. Therefore, it must, in self-defense, withstand the free introduction of degenerate stock. Who is the writer? The writer is Francis Galton, who coined the term eugenics, an excellent biography uh, by Martin Brooks, pictured on the left, the cover, Extreme Measures, the Dark Visions and Bright Ideas of Francis Galton, the plaque in the church where he's buried, 1822 to 1911, a first cousin, by the way, of Charles Darwin, and a polymath. Many branches of science owe much to his labors. He was the one who first developed regression analysis, for example. But the dominant idea of his life's work was to measure the influence of heredity on the mental and physical attributes of mankind. And he writes in this article, hereditary talent and character. 
If a 20th part of the cost and pains were spent in measures for the improvement of the human race that is spent on the improvement of the breed of horses and cattle, what a galaxy of genius might we not create? We might introduce prophets and high priests of civilization into the world as surely as we can propagate idiots by mating cretins. Men and women of the present day are to those we might hope to bring into existence what the pariah dogs of the streets of an Eastern town, he's not talking about the East Coast, he's talking about the Orient in a pejorative way, are to our own highly bred varieties. So this is the thinking and the words of Galton who brought eugenics into focus. And that brings us to the eugenics movement in America. The American context for eugenics included slavery, mass immigration in the mid 19th to early 20th century, crime considered a group phenomenon, the heritability purportedly of inferiority, and a strong belief, and this is chastening, in the power of science or what they thought was science. The American eugenics movement included positive and negative eugenics, and I'll give examples of each. Certainly an example of negative eugenics, preventing the offspring of perceived inferior individuals were the mandatory sterilization laws with about as many as 60,000 Americans, mostly women, sterilized through the 1960s, but also the anti-miscegenation laws ending with the Supreme Court case of Loving versus Virginia in 1967. And importantly, the Johnson-Reed Act in Congress in 1924, restricting Im immigration from selected geographic regions, Southeastern Europe, based on racial theories and assumptions of inferiority. And this was only loosened in 1965. Here is a poster from the Second International Congress of Eugenics held in 1921 at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And you see the portrayal of eugenics as a huge tree. It's the self-direction as defined of human evolution. Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. The president of this Congress, Henry Fairfield Osborne, talks about the right of the state to safeguard the character and integrity of the race or races on which the future depends. To my mind, he says that's as incontestable as the right of the state to safeguard the health and morals of people. As science has enlightened government in the prevention and spread of disease, and I wanna pause here again, compulsory vaccination, isolation in the case of contagious diseases, these are public health measures, both of which have been very much in the news. It must also enlighten government in the spread and multiplication of worthless members of society, the spread of feeble-mindedness, of idiocy, and of all moral, intellectual, as well as physical diseases. Examples of positive eugenics. The Kansas State Fair. Under the eugenics building, we see winners of a fitter family contest. What are the criteria? Better baby contest, the Indiana State Fair. Blue ribbons given for the perceived better baby. So these were role models as examples of positive eugenics. Also, warnings. How long are we Americans to be agree of our and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment. And on the left, you see the various marriages, fit and unfit, pure and pure mating, that's great, children normal. But look at the other possibilities as if this was some simple Mendelian trait. Here are listed the state criteria for legal eugenical sterilization. Eventually, 27 states, beginning with Indiana in 1907, legalized sterilization for the various bases you see here, feeble-minded, insane, epileptic, et cetera, et cetera. California was the leader in the numbers of people sterilized. So we come to the disciple and accolade of Francis Galton, Charles Benedict Davenport, a Harvard educated faculty member, director of experimental evolution at Cold Spring Harbor, 1911, and yes, Cold Spring Harbor, the same place that the Cold Spring Harbor Labs are located now with Harriman and Rockefeller support. His monograph, Heredity in Relation to Eugenics in 1911, a critical text in this field. And he writes, modern medicine is responsible for the loss of appreciation of the power of heredity. It has neglected the personal element that determines the course of every disease. 
It has forgotten the fundamental fact that all men are created bound by their protoplasmic makeup and unequal in their powers and responsibilities. Perversely, but frankly, in some sense, he is a pioneer in the concept of personalized medicine. And he collected a variety of pedigrees of real genetics, Huntington disease, hemophilia. But in examples of his pseudogenetics, he collected pedigrees of families with pauperism, as if that was a Mendelian trait. And my favorite, the lassophilia, love of the sea. This was a family with three generations of sea captains, as if, again, that was a simple Mendelian trait. This book, put out appropriately by Cold Spring Harbor Press, Davenport Stream, 21st Century Reflections on Hereditary Eugenics, provides a number of examples of the implications of Davenport's work and the ramifications for the American eugenics movement. Now, if I seem to be Harvard bashing, uh, I hope no one takes it entitled When Academics Embrace Scientific Racism. Immigration, in part, he says, because Harvard was more central to the American eugenics than any other university. He wrote a monograph, Imbeciles, the Supreme Court, American Eugenics, and the Sterilization of Carrie Buck. And this really led me into a deeper consideration of this subject. The Immigration Restriction League, founded in 1894, he indicates, was done by three recent Harvard grads. Now, look at this uh, cartoon from Puck. It shows five tycoons warding off an itinerant peddler coming off a ship to immigrate into the United States. And what is striking is the shadows behind these tycoons, their relatively threadbare forebears that they're very interested in forgetting about their own uh, origins while they ward off this individual. So let's consider a little further some of the Prussian writings uh, of Davenport. He writes, can we build a wall high enough around this country so as to keep out these cheaper races? Or will it only be a feeble dam which will worsen the flood when it breaks? Society must protect itself as it claims the right to deprive the murderer of his life so it may also annihilate the hopeful, hopelessly vicious protoplasm by segregation during reproductive years or even by sterilization. And this is a letter and report to the ABA, which is the American Breeders Association. And then considers this chapter five, migrations and the eugenic significance from his monograph. The proper way to classify immigrants for admission or rejection is on the basis of the probable performance of their germplasm. In other words, immigrants are desirable who are good blood, quote unquote, undesirable who are bad blood. Since blood cannot be judged by inspection of the individual, what practical method remains for separating the sheep from the goats? Experience indicates the only best way, the one best way. Before any one person is admitted to citizenship, let something be learned considering or concerning his family history and his personal history on the other side of the ocean. How can this be done? By means of field workers. So Davenport is really talking about a large bureaucracy who would screen individuals in advance and thereby perceive and distinguish those of good versus bad blood. So I want to illustrate the conundrum of this attitude toward immigration with two contrasting poems. One is undoubtedly very familiar to most of you, The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, 1883, emblazoned on the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. And I won't even read it, you know it very well. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But how many of you are familiar with Thomas Bailey Aldrich who wrote this poem in 1892, The Unguarded Gates? And the poem reads, wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them presses a wild motley throng, men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Huang Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn. O oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? And in this cartoon, we see that throwing down the ladder by which they rose, by which who rose? The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So this form of immigration restriction goes way back 
But ultimately, it was the Johnson Reed Act in 1924, written about by Daniel Ockrent in his book, whose title is taken from the Aldrich poem, The Guarded Gate, bigotry, eugenics, and the law that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. And apropos, uh, or after reading this book, uh, I wrote on the blog that Einstein Medical School keeps called The Doctor's Tablet about Arno Matulski and the spirit of St. Louis. And this referred to Arno Matulski being turned away at the age of 18 on the ship, the St. Louis, famously forced to return to Europe. And he narrowly escaped the Nazi death camps. He eventually did emigrate to the United States where he went on to a storied career at the University of Washington as the founder with Victor McCusick of the field of medical genetics and the mentor of people such as Mary Clay, Claire King and Joe Goldstein. Think of the extraordinary talent pool that the guarded gate sought to exclude. There's a further ramification of the American eugenics movement. And that is that it literally was the inspiration for the Nazis. The Nazi connection by Stefan Kuhl, eugenics, American racism, and German national socialism. A whole nother lecture could be given on this subject, but I want to just briefly consider a few points. Here is a Nazi propaganda poster from 1936 supporting the Nazi Germany's 1933 law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring. Wir stehen nicht allein, we don't stand alone, says this Nazi poster and prominently displays flags, prominently the US flag of other countries that preceded them. And C.M. Goethe, a California eugenics leader, writes in 1934, to his colleagues, you will be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of the group of intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epoch making program. Everywhere I sense that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought. A Yale Law School professor, James Whitman, authored this book, Hitler's American Model, The United States and the Making of Nazi Race Law. The second Nuremberg law he found was actually modeled on Jim Crow laws, second class citizenship, voting rights deleted. The third Nuremberg law modeled itself on American anti-miscegenation laws punishable by imprisonment, culminating in Loving versus Virginia, which I referred to. Interestingly, the US was more stringent in defining so-called mongrels, the one drop rule in terms of black blood, defining someone as being black. Nazi Germany, one quarter Jew was sufficient to make one a Jew for the purposes of the Nazi race laws. Hitler, while imprisoned in Landsberg, Germany, wrote to Madison Grant, the order, author of the book, The Passing of the Great Race, and referred to the book as, quote, my Bible. In essence, Grant was writing about the dilution and the danger to the great race of Nordic individuals who he viewed as the key founders of the United States by the undesirable immigrants and indigenous American Indians, as well as slaves who had been liberated. In Mein Kampf, Hitler lauded the US immigration restrictions with their first quota law and the preservation of what he called das Volk. Further, he also in Mein Kampf gave the doctrine of Lebensraum, Drang nach Osten. Literally, what it means is room to live for the German folk, press toward the East. And in a mirror image of this, he applauded the decimation of American Indians with the westward migration of the American quote unquote pioneers and settlers. This reflection of Nazi Germany on the American eugenics movement is then commented on in this New England Journal of Medicine piece in August of 1934, Sterilization and Its Possible Accomplishments. And the piece says at the bottom on the left, Germany is perhaps the most progressive nation in restricting fecundity among the unfit. And then they go on to say, in America, it is probable that the sentiment of the people is not ready for the adoption of the German plan and will be inclined to restrict compulsory sterilization to a small proportion of those who might probably be regarded as especially fit subjects for the treatment. 
And what they go on to say is that perhaps we'll have to mold public sentiment. So this gives you a feeling of how mainstream in terms of legitimate medicine, this whole notion and the pseudoscience of racial genetics and compulsory sterilization was. Finally, here is a magazine cover from the magazine Zona in Taos, literally a sun or sunlight in the house, taken from the photo con contest to find the most beautiful Aryan baby, Germany 1935, another example of quote, role models for positive eugenics, except who is this baby? This baby is Hesse Levinson's Taft, born to Jewish parents in Berlin 1934. The photographer knew that the family was Jewish, but deliberately entered the photo in the contest because he, quote, wanted to make the Nazis ridiculous. The family escaped via France in 1938 and Cuba and eventually made their way to the U.S. in 1949, where Ms. Levinson, the most beautiful, quote, Aryan baby, majored in chemistry at Barnard, taught at Rutgers, and worked on the AP chemistry exam for the educational testing service. Now, David Reich, the cover of his book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, is a world expert in ancient DNA and the new science of the human past. He's a Hughes investigator in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And his large scale sequencing of ancient DNA from fossilized bones revolutionized our understanding of human origins, migrations, intermingling, and the simplistic concept of race. He's able to document the genomics of inequality. So first, among self-described African-Americans, 5,000 samples sent to 23andMe, the average European ancestry was 27%. So there's clearly a spectrum of admixture, as should be clear. The male contribution, however, of European ancestry in African-Americans is far from random. It is fourfold greater than the female contribution. And why is there the sex bias? Because the predominant matings were white men and black women, for example, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And then Reich talks about the genomics of inequality and so-called star clusters, large numbers of a male line descendants derived from a single powerful prolific male, purportedly Genghis Khan or O'Donnell clan, descendants of Nile, of Nile, O'Donnell, a medieval Irish warlord. So now let's make the transition from this brief history of eugenics in America to selected advances in 21st century medicine and what I'm calling a new eugenics era. Now we should celebrate many of these advances. They have had the capacity to enhance our ability to diagnose and prevent disease, to relieve suffering, but at the same time, bioethical questions with them. Next gen sequencing, so called, of DNA, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, has allowed carrier screening, DNA testing before marriage, prenatal genome based screening, pre implantation genetic diagnosis with IVF, in vitro fertilization, and even newborn screening by genomic sequence as opposed to mass spec and other measures that have been used to date. Further, there are tremendous advances in molecular and cell biology that have facilitated gene therapy, in utero fetal therapy, so-called three-parent IVF, reproductive cloning, genome editing, both somatic and germline. So let's consider some selected examples and the questions they raise. Non-invasive prenatal testing allows drawing blood from the pregnant mother and the detection of fetal DNA in the form of placental DNA that is cell-free and found in the circulation in the mother's blood. And this can be analyzed in a straightforward way, for example, for trisomies 21, 18, or 13. What are the ramifications? Well, it obviously allows for termination of pregnancies of purportedly undesirable offspring. But you see on the right, a child with the typical eye features of Down syndrome, trisomy 21, and a group called Loving Every Child Defying Eugenics. And then a book, very interesting book by Andrew Solomon called Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity. And in this book, it's a play, the title on the aphorism, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
But as he points out, it may fall very far from the tree in the sense that a hearing impaired child of normal hearing parents has more in common in some ways with other offspring that are hearing impaired than with the parents. A child with congenitally short stature with parents with normal stature. And there actually have been examples of parents with what's called achondroplasia, a form of genetically determined short stature, who have wanted to do prenatal diagnosis to abort a quote, normal stature child because they felt that that child would not relate normally to them as parents. So this really raises questions. What, what is actually normal? How do we define quote, normal? And in fact, you have the conundrum of state laws, for example, Ohio, banning abortion in cases of Down syndrome, where you buck up against pro-choice advocates on the one hand, and advocates for the rights of people with Down syndrome. So profound questions that defy easy resolution. Now, not far from the Einstein campus in the Bronx, you can see a van parked occasionally, which is pictured here, and it performs paternity, legal DNA, immigration DNA, heritage studies, on-site drug testing, and a number of other services. But the big exploding logo says it all, DNA testing, who's your daddy? And what it signifies is that certain minority populations, DNA testing raises more concerns about paternity and criminal databases than it does uh, comfort with the idea of uh, detecting uh, genetic disease and possibly early treatment. An example of prenatal diagnosis and indeed pre-marriage, pre-marital screening, is this group called Dor Yesharim, Safeguarding the Health of Future Generations. It was built on the premise that recessive genetic disorders prevalent in Jewish circles, Tay-Sachs, Canavans, many others, have absolutely no reason to be perpetuated. And the logo actually in the O is preventing tears. This was founded by an ultra-Orthodox rabbi who had two successive offspring dying early with Tay-Sachs disease. And here's an instance where culturally, this particular group of Orthodox Jews practices arranged marriages. That is the societal norm for them. And so by doing a panel, a gene panel of so-called Jewish genetic diseases, they preclude marriages of partners where there's the 25% chance on a Mendelian basis of inheriting an autosomal recessive disease. But there's another version of this, the new eugenics, a company called Gene Peaks, performing variant gene dysfunction score based on simulation. The founders, Lee Silver, a geneticist at Princeton, and Morris at Harvard Business School. Protecting our children is in our DNA, and they show you. You can look at the virtual sperm by knowing the paternal contribution of DNA. You can look at the virtual egg, and then the virtual progeny genomes to screen out what could turn out to be what happened to Ann Morris. She and her wife bought sperm from a sperm bank, and the son ended up having medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. They sued and then founded this company. So an interesting variant on the Doria Sharim model. And then we have another example of, in this case, positive eugenics, of the bizarre tale of the rise and fall of an elitist sperm bank. This book by David Plotz, The Genius Factory, The Curious History of the Nobel Prize Sperm Bank. This Robert Graham, an eyeglass tycoon, founded the company in 1980 with entrepreneurial vigor, cockamamie grandeur, unshakable faith in practical science, contempt for the so-called pig ignorant lazy masses, and infatuation with finding and claiming the world's best men. For example, the Nobel laureate William Shockley, a noted and well-noted racist. This folded in 1999. And then there's the Harvard Program in Evolutionary Dynamics funded with several million dollars by this individual, 
who did not himself attend Harvard, but I guess if, if you donate enough, you do get a sweatshirt. And some of you may recognize this individual as the late Jeffrey Epstein, who hoped to see the human race with his DNA. He is part of an organization that was called Transhumanity Plus, which had the goal of transhumanism. And, and what does it mean, transhumanism? The, it advocates the ethical use, ethical being in the eye of the beholder, of technology to expand human capacities. We want people to be better than well. We want to intervene with human physiology for curing disease and repairing injury to the point that you can increase performance outside the realm of what's considered normal. And he gives examples of the technology involved. Now, this picture shown in this Washington Post article is showing a family reunion, but it's a peculiar kind of family. It's a family of half siblings, 44 to be exact, because of the lack of regulation in the United States of sperm banks, IVF, and other reproductive technologies. And the ability to search DNA databases has facilitated finding these half siblings. So that as you can see documented in, in time, a total of 44 half siblings from a single sperm donor. Why? Presumably because of the published characteristics of this male sperm donor, perhaps height, hair color, perceived intelligence, making this person a sought after sperm donor for so many women who don't necessarily each know about the other. And so the ethics and problematic nature of this is profound. Even as far back as 2009, the Wall Street Journal had this piece about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. A baby, please, blonde, freckles, hold the colic. So with IVF, having an embryo at the eight, stage, eight cell stage, it's possible to remove a cell, do the genetic diagnosis looking for diseases such as cystic fibrosis or the BRCA1 tumor suppressor gene and then only implanting in the womb the quote, normal embryos. But in principle, one could use the same technology for a quote, designer baby. A slightly related example is three parent IVF. There are some devastating inherited mitochondrial diseases where the problem is not in the nuclear genome, but in the smaller amount of mitochondrial DNA. And uh, this illustration, and I won't go through the technical details, but fundamentally, you are taking the normal egg of a woman whose mitochondria do not harbor the mitochondrial DNA mutation and implanting in the enucleated zygote, the zygote from the mother with the abnormal mitochondria and the father's sperm, so that you've reconstructed three parent IVF genomic DNA, nuclear DNA from father and one mother and mitochondrial DNA from another. This is being performed in the UK legally. It is not legal in the United States. There are purportedly some rogue clinics where this has been performed. And then the topic of reproductive cloning. Somatic cell nuclear transfer to a nucleated oocyte was actually performed by J.B. Gurdon, who shared the Nobel Prize he did this as far back as 1962 in frogs. However, I guess people don't get that excited about frogs. Sheep, however, was another matter. There was an explosion of interest when the late Ian Wilmot created Dolly the sheep. And you can see on the right, the same technology, the nucleus of an adult cell into the mature nucleated ovum of another mother, then the egg, with a mild electric shock was stimulated to cleavage and implanted in the surrogate mother. And then the lamb born is a clone of sheep one. So that was Dolly the sheep and it led to a whole spate of possibilities in terms of reproductive cloning. And here is an example, reproductive cloning of dogs. On the left, some of you may know that this is the late Leona Helmsley, a notorious spouse of Harry Helmsley, the New York real estate magnate, And she's holding her Maltese dog, Trouble. She was so crestfallen when Trouble died 
that she got another dog, another Maltese, whom she named Double Trouble and eventually left $250 million for the care of the dog. But that was before reproductive cloning of dogs was feasible. For Barbara Streisand, in contrast, since she loved these Bichon Frise dogs, she was able to clone several. And here she's shown at her Malibu estate. And then ultimately, the question was, what about reproductive cloning of humans? And on the left, you see Claude Vorilone, known as Claude Rail, whose group, the Raelians, actually advocated somatic cell nuclear transfer to oocytes, embryo implantation in human surrogates, yes to human cloning, eternal life thanks to science. As far as we know, this has not actually happened. At the time, this was going on in the early 2000s when I was NIDDK director, I found myself at the center of the embryonic stem cell controversy, testifying at numerous congressional hearings. And one of the awkwardly termed ideas, therapeutic cloning, which didn't involve reproductive cloning at all, tended to bring up this very problematic idea. Ronald Dworkin, NYU law school professor writes in 2000, playing God, genes, clones, and luck. Cloning, if available, and he's talking about of humans, is bound to be hideously expensive for a long time. Hence would be available only to rich people who would want out of vanity to clone themselves, increasing the unfair advantages of wealth. So those horrified by the prospect of cloning have cited the specter of thousands of Rupert Mur Murdoch's, or perhaps even worse, Donald Trump's. And now, much more recent is this picture from a paper in Nature Portfolio, two groups, one at UT Southwestern, one at Monash University in Australia, are written about March 17, 2021. Scientists create living entities in the lab that closely resemble human embryos. And the bioethicist at George, Georgetown, Daniel Salmasi, talks about how nervous, morally, seriously nervous people get seeing these structures so close to early human beings in a Petri dish. And it raises the question, which this New Yorker cartoon, of course, pokes fun at. This unusual orchid has one elephant saying to the other, the scientists never stop to ask if they should, only if they could. Well, that's not completely true. As described in this review in the Annual Review of Genomics and Human Genetics in 2014 by a group of authors from the Genome Research Institute, senior author Mark Geyer, reflections on the ongoing experiment of ELSI, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Program of the Institute, established in 1993 with the NIH Revitalization Act, at least 5% budget set aside, but importantly, the ELSI program conducts research. It does not set policy. And some have raised the question, does the ELSI program foster what's called genetic exceptionalism? Is there something different about doing a blood test on a metabolite or a protein than doing it on DNA? Well, perhaps the reason for that sensitivity, that genetic exceptionalism, is the rumblings about the inherently, quote, eugenic or potentially racist nature of the genetics and genomics enterprise. And then we come to CRISPR, uh, a technique not so new anymore. Uh, this is from The Economist in 2015 for manipulating genes, genome editing. What about editing humanity? No baldness, high IQ, perfect pitch, sprinter, 2020 vision, low risk of disease. And this is not science fiction. This is a poster from uh, the company Editas, and it indicates different examples of developing, quote, best-in-class CRISPR medicines. So this is now somatic cell genome editing, a somewhat lesser bioethical concern since any changes made would not be propagated in offspring. Cancer, autologous T-cell medicines, allogeneic cell medicines, blood diseases such as sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia, these can be subject to engineering outside the body in hematopoietic stem cells or T cells, or inside the body, such as ocular diseases, where the eye is, particularly the retina, 
quite susceptible to uh, genetic manipulations. And they give examples of some uh, ocular diseases. So this is real. And it's real because the FDA is already developing criteria with 26 INDs uh, at the time of this slide, which was in 2019, 34 pre-INDs. They take a, quote, science-based approach, benefit-risk analysis. But this is all, strictly speaking, somatic cell genetics and editing. The National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine convened a group to look at the science, ethics, and governance of human genome editing in 2017. And this is their report. But this is not a static field. There have now been two summits pre-pandemic, one in Washington, D.C. in 2015, and a second in Hong Kong in November of 2018, to look at the implications of human genome editing, and in particular, the issues of germline genome editing, global perspectives. As this second summit was taking place, the spectacular news of a Chinese researcher claiming to have created the first gene edited babies came out. And that report involved He Zhangjui of Shenzhen, who said he altered embryos for seven couples during fertility treatments with one pregnancy resulting thus far. And the idea was to edit the gene for the receptor CCR5 where it is known that there are naturally occurring deletion mutations that provide actually resistance to HIV because it is a co-receptor along with CD4. Verify this, I'm told by some colleagues that he is in prison at the moment. But this will use of human germline genome editing, National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Society. And they issued this consensus study report heritable human genome editing. And this was in part uh, because of the CRISPR babies in China, fresh in many minds. Uh, they decided that there's no broad international consensus for heritable human genome editing. Scientific evidence would be needed. And they say, and this is important from the second bullet, is important to recognize the idea of making intentional modifications to the human germline evokes to some the eugenics movement of the late 19th century and first half of the 20th century, which promoted now discredited theories that led to the persecution of whole groups based on race, religion, class, and ability. Should any nation decide to permit heritable human genome editing, it is vitally important that bias and discrimination be avoided. In addition, there must be constraints that prevent the use of heritable human genome editing for cases that are not medically justified interventions and not based on a rigorous understanding of genetics. And they issued 11 total recommendations in the report. I only reproduce three here. Suffice it to say, the report basically concludes that no one should be trying this now, that extensive societal dialogue is needed and that it really isn't possible yet to define a responsible translational pathway to do this. Uh, in many instances, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis should be preferred, not having consequences in terms of progeny. And there have been already reports, of course, of orf target effects of attempts at CRISPR editing. So this is very, very much an open question, and it remains to be seen how society at large, how uh, the various countries and, and oversight groups uh, will try to resolve this issue. So finally, let me conclude with some issues that I think are brought to the forefront in our consideration of our new eugenics era. As the cartoon said, should scientists consider not only whether they could, but whether they should. That is not just whether something is technically feasible, but what are the ethical, sociologic, and other legal implications. Before recombinant DNA was a widespread phenomenon, there was a self-assembled group at Asilomar to set out guidelines, stem cells, cloning, gene therapy, the RAC, recombinant DNA advisory committee, genome editing, somatic versus germline. I've given you the illustration of the national academies who are beginning to try to develop both US and with other countries, global, policies. Second, how can we assure objectivity and rigor in science when using it to establish policy? Importantly, 
Galton, Davenport, their contemporaries were convinced that they were rigorous scientists. Do we have the hubris to think that our decisions are absolutely rigorous and clear? Further, number three, how can we distinguish between promoting well-being, health versus enhancement? What constitutes normal and should we even make such distinctions and who should make such distinctions? Fourth, how do we balance individual rights versus the public good? How do we define the latter and who gets to decide? These are questions that transcend the issues of genetics and eugenics. These are questions we're confronting now with issues of the pandemic, compulsory va vaccination, isolation. For example, during the Ebola epidemic, when an infected individual came to New York City. So the, these are transcendent questions. Fifth, what role should government play in regulating and legislating reproductive processes? Is a clear difference between the UK, which has had clear oversight and policies regarding fertility and reproduction versus the US, where it's been essentially do what you will. Our history of compulsory sterilization legislation versus current laws restricting abortions and outlawing research on human embryos raise all sorts of questions as to how the role of government should proceed. And finally, how can we establish a fair immigration policy? Restrictions based on racial and ethnic bias then and now for sure versus socioeconomic policy. I certainly don't have the answers to these questions, but I hope that presenting this lecture to you and thought leaders at the NIH, trainees who will establish science in the future, you will at least contemplate these and together with others, hopefully help us find a way forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Alan. Uh, we have uh, several comments and um, two questions. Let me first mention the, the comment by Griffin Rogers, your successor at NIDDK, notes that Paul Lombardo, whom you mentioned, uh, a professor at the University of Virginia, in 2008 published a book called Three Generations, No Imbeciles. And in it, he covers what you mentioned, but also points out that among those supporting the eugenics movement uh, explicitly and vigorously were Woodrow Wilson, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, uh, the Rock Rockefeller family, the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie and others. So in terms of changing the names of organizations, to say the least, but just in terms of how prevalent this became, not only in science and not only at Harvard, but throughout the whole uh, American establishment. And as you pointed out, the, as strongly in England, I don't know whether in, in Europe in general, it was uh, at that point as strong, but it, it was so prevalent. The question is why why was it so uh, ubiquitous in acceptance at, for those 50 years or so. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Rogers' uh, reference, and uh, uh, I, I will look for that book. I had actually not found it, but I found several references to Professor Lombardo at UVA Law School. Uh, it's, it's a sad story. It, it really, as you pointed out, didn't become very prevalent people uh you know there's a quote that i like from julius caesar's gallic wars homines facula credo and leave that which they wish and in this sense uh the people espousing these theories were firmly of the belief that their quote racial stock was the superior one and the history of phrenology skull measures stephen jay gould the mismeasure of man uh, shows how pseudoscience can support those kinds of wishful thinking. I think uh, to bring it full circle, why interest and enthusiasm waned in the United States was the discovery of what the Nazis perpetrated with the Holocaust, with uh, the death camps and the, the revulsion that ensued. But notably, the, the sterilization did not finally end till the 1960s in some states. So it's it's sociologically a very interesting phenomenon. And of course, the immigration part of it uh, is very much with us, as you can see. 
One of the listeners asked whether or not the current activities of the Gates Foundation in Africa and other parts of the world has some element of this implicit in its work. I don't, I don't know what work he's alluding to, but I don't know whether this has come up in, in other discussions. Uh, I, I personally, first of all, there have been so many allegations leveled against Bill and Melinda Gates, Bill in particular. Uh, of course, those of us who have been vaccinating are all walking around with chips implanted by Bill Gates. That's one of the allegations. Uh, so I, I find it hard to understand uh, how that yeah. would, would happen. So no to the Gates Foundation, although I don't doubt that people would think of that. However, one individual who has come in for criticism recently is Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood. And the claim is that while she's associated now as a very progressive organization, as we all know, that the restriction of pregnancies in the African-American population was one of her purported goals. So that allegation has been leveled against someone like Margaret Sanger. Yes. A, a, another question that came in was, um, were there any countries or activities opposed to these ideas. For example, in the 1920s and 30s, was Japan, as it was modernizing and claiming hegemony over Asia, were they uh, advocating similar policies? Did these ideas spread beyond America and England at that point? About Japan in particular. Yes. Uh, the other uh, problems that occurred with China, that they are unequivocally racist, yes. that the Japanese are quite racist yes. or were. So, but I, I don't know that they uh, treated their own population. The, the, the important point that I maybe should have emphasized, uh, I had that propaganda poster. With the Nazis emulating uh, the United States and the American eugenics, I'm not talking strictly speaking about the Holocaust and even the Nuremberg laws as they related to Jews. I'm talking about their euthanizing individuals that they perceived as inferior who were Germans, including people who were deaf or thought to be retarded. The, the German artist Gerhard Richter uh, biographically uh, had uh, a sister who was euthanized. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a sister, it's a close relative, euthanized by the Nazis uh, because of perceived uh, inadequacy. So th they were in the early stages and in fact, uh, some of the techniques used, including gassing, were a precursor for the eventual uh, elimination of, of Jews and others in concentration camps. Okay. Um, it's now a bit after one. I think probably we. there are other points and questions. I, I might make one point. Nathaniel Comfort, as well as others who've written about the history of medical genetics, have pointed Mukherjee, Keith Waylu, and, and David Reich that you mentioned have all emphasized how medical genetics itself was born and had has had to dissociate itself from the eugenics movement. And that's not been an easy transition. And until even the 50s and 60s, the connection between the origin of the medical genetics field and its current incarnation as a medical specialty has been a difficult one to d distinguish. But I, I think it's after our time and we should end. Uh, let me thank you on behalf of uh, our audience, the NIH History Office, and uh, um, I'm sure people will contact you about specific questions and points. But I, And again, I hope that people will join us in May for the next lecture in the series, which will be announced in detail shortly. Thank you.